in, in 1735, the uh, father of classification, Linnaeus, a great Swedish botanist, went around the world, literally, and found plants and found insects and classified them. And he invented the basic classification structure for natural history. And Linnaeus said, uh, oh, wait a minute, as he roamed the world, he noticed that even people look differently from one place to the other. And he thought perhaps even the human species could be subcategorized into different population groups. And um, he came up with four. Americanus, Asiaticus, Africanus, Europeanus. <laughs> I, I, that was <laughs> but nevertheless, <laughs> what I what I want to uh, do, and I if you get a slide, you'll see this in a second, but I'll. I'll he defined these different human species. One of them was reddish, caloric, hair black, straight, thick, wide nostrils, scanty beard, obstinate, merry, free, paints himself with fine red lines, and is regulated by custom. That's the Indian population. And here's another one of these species. Sallow, melancholy, stiff, hair black, dark eyes, severe, haughty, avaricious, covered with loose garments, and ruled by a penny. The Asian? Black, phlegmatic, relaxed, hair black, frizzled, skin silky, nose flat, lips tumid, women without shame, they lactate profusely. <laughs> Crafty, indolent, negligent, anoints himself with grease, governed by caprice. The Africans. I've got one race to go. I'm not going to say it again. White, sanguine, muscular, hair long, flowy, eyes blue, gentle, acute, inventive covers himself with close vestments and is governed by law. This was the most distinguished natural historian probably in human history. And um, don't have to worry about all of the words, but just imagine. He wanted to not only describe these species uh, uh, and their, uh, their, their physically and so forth, but he also wanted to give us a sense of what their character was. And I'll just reread the, the, the key, key ones. Uh, the, the American Indian, regulated by custom. The Asian, ruled by opinion. The African, governed by caprice. And the European, governed by law. So there it is, right from the beginning, we, 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 we imagine that these different human species have uh, not just physiological differences, but characterological, moral uh, differences. Then about um, uh, a couple of decades later, uh, a student of Linnaeus, uh, a German named Blumenbach, a medical doctor, wrote an extremely important book called The Natural Varieties of Mankind. And uh, he not only described them differently using climate theory, but sort of did what Linnaeus did. Um, and then he also said it, it, it really is rank order. Uh, yeah, it really does. And he has Caucasians at the top and the Negro Ethiopian at the bottom. The only thing that, that Blumenbach does, which, which Linnaeus did not do, is he actually added a. Just the light seems to be turned off, but I'm going to switch. Oh, it's happening? 
there, there, the first slide, is that it? Yeah. You can start read it. But anyway, you've got it in your stuff so you can see it. Um, so this is Blue Bond, Caucasian, Mongoloid, Malay, Native American, Negro. The only thing he did was he said, no, they're really not just four, they're five. And he separated uh, the Asian into two groups, the Pacific Islanders and the, uh, the other Asian population. And he gave us the fact that we now have a color pentagon. We have white, yellow, brown, red, and black. Uh, this was in 1776. Really, something really very interesting happened 220 years later in the United States government. We caught up with them. We finally, finally uh, decided, yes, there were five primary races, and uh, this is the OMB classification standards over five primary races, uh, the Indian, uh, Alaskan Native, Asian, Black, African American, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, so forth. Same five. Five primary races in the official statistical system of the United States, which simply reproduced Blumenbach 220 years later. Talk about stickiness in bureaucratic processes. And that's got a lot of staying power, these categories, and it has no consequence. Not only did we sort of decide that there are these five, you can't quite tell it from this thing, but I think it is, there are five, and as it said, then, then, then this United States has two ethnicities, yes, no, Hispanic, non-Hispanic. And then, of course, having adopted these standards, they're not only using the census, they're using everything. Uh, when, when Columbia University reports back to the Department of Education about its, the composition of the student body, these are the categories that they have to use. Uh, when you take in a patient at a hospital, tick some boxes, these are the categories, these five primary categories. You can use subcategories, but you have to be able to aggregate back to these five primary categories. Now, so that's what we have. We get ready for census 2000, we ask a question. We're gonna ask two questions. One is, are you Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish? No, or yes? And if yes, well, you can tell us whether you're Mexican American, Chicano, Puerto Rican, Cuban. Um, and if you're Hispanic and not one of those, uh, then you would write it in, uh, in a box underneath. So, we start by simply saying the population is, is uh, either Hispanic or non-Hispanic, um, and then we have some subcategories. But the instruction on this question says, uh, this is not a race. This is something different. Uh, this is about Hispanic origins, actually about Hispanic language. Uh, for example, um, uh, Brazilians are not Hispanic they don't speak Spanish. Um, so there's a, a, uh, a national origin linguistic dimension to this particular ethnicity, but not racial. Okay, then we also ask a race question. And you can't quite see the Blumenbachian categories in this question, but but they're there. Is this person, what is this person's race? White, black, African American, or Negro, American Indian, or Alaska Native, and then you print the enrolled tribe, and then there's a whole list of other things you can say yes or no. And this, the list on that side, Asian, Japanese, Korean, Vietnamese, and so forth, are in effect what, what Blumenbach meant by the Asian category, and the ones on this side, Native Hawaiian and so forth, the Pacific Islanders. And in each instance, if we don't give you enough examples, then you can write other kinds of things uh, under, underneath if, if you want to. Quickly on this, if you think about this for a moment, it conflates many different things. Some of the races are there because they have a color, white, black. The American Indian is there because they belong in enrolled tribes, that's the civil status. And if you read the question, what is this person's race? This question is telling you 
that all these other things are individual races, right? I mean, it doesn't actually say, like it said in the Hispanic question, are you of Hispanic origin? And then here's some subcategories. Here, there's no sort of sense that these are necessarily subcategories. So presumably, you know, Chinese is its own race, Korean is its own race, Filipino, Samoan, and so forth are all races in this question. Um, uh, this particular question is very proud of the word race, the word itself. It appears in the title. What is this person's race? It then says, uh, uh, down here, uh, if you want, if you're not one of these things, print your race. Down here, print your race. Then there's another line that says some other race. And then you write that down. Then there's something else going on in this question. It says mark one or more boxes. That was the result of an enormously important political argument in the society, one of the primary um, Participants in that, uh, in that uh, discussion is with us today, uh, Ted Shaw, who will share his own views on it. Um, whether we should or should not have a, 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 a multiple race option, uh, we chose not to have a multiple race option as a standalone category. We chose instead to say mark one or more ba race, which gives you, you know, multiple races. Indeed, it, if you mark Chinese and Korean, you would not be multiple race, even though it the question reads as if that would be true, but that's not true. You can only be multiple race if you are some combination of the five primary races. Five primary races plus some other race gives you a total of 63 possible combinations. Some other race. If, if this is exhausting, if everybody belongs in one of the five primary races, that Blumenbach told us to pay attention to, then what would some other race do? Australian Aboriginal? White. Aboriginal Indian, white, and the Australian would be white. The, 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 the notion of a, of a, but that's a good guess. I mean, it's not a bad answer. I didn't mean that. But the, um, the American Indian means to include all kinds of native peoples, of, of pre, pre colonialized native Aboriginal people. Uh, so they could be from, from Canada, from Australia, whatever. We actually don't have a lot of Australian Aboriginal here, probably. But that's, that's the category they would go into if we did. It, they would go into the American and, and Alaskan Navy category. Oddly. <coughs> that doesn't mean they couldn't write that down. And, and if they wrote it down, we would write it. But um, and I'm going to talk just briefly about the some other race. Then I want to move quickly to get the panel up here. Some other race was actually put on the census form in 1920 in order to accommodate people that could be more than one race. <coughs> Up until 1920, starting in 1850, 1920, we asked the question mulatto on the census form. The question mulatto went off, and then after 19, on, in 1920, and then starting in 1930, we put in some other race. So that if people wanted to put down two things, they could do it. You won't believe what I'm about to tell you. This question, the mark, mark one or more uh, races, uh, the fact that it would be five primary and so forth, went through enormous, uh, intense process, bureaucratic processes, uh, of public hearings in Congress, um, uh, uh, meetings around the country, uh, tons of academic meetings and papers and so forth, and a big, big, big process. And some other race wasn't part of that discussion because that was something left over from history. <laughs> you won't believe this. The Census Bureau and the OMB forgot to take it off. Forgot to take it off. Didn't notice it was there. And it had been there to take care of the tick more than one box phenomena, but that was no longer relevant. And so it stayed on the form. After the 2000 census, the Census Bureau sort of said in its bureaucratically naive, marvelous way, they're just statisticians and people like that, you know, we better take the some other race off before we get to 2010 because it doesn't give us good data. However, as Angelo will tell us, by then, the fastest growing race in America was Mexican American. 97% of the people who wrote something down there were Mexican-American and Central American. 
And Spandex, who said, wait a minute, we're not just this thing called some ethnicity. We are also, we think we may even be a race or whatever. We don't see, find ourselves in these other lists, so we're going to write ourselves down there. And um, more than, about half, 47% of, of Hispanics actually end up writing something down there. And I say the number of people who use that is almost exclusively uh, uh, Hispanic. So that's the fastest growing race in America, some other race. Now, I think this is a mess. I think this conflates, it, 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 it's got deep historical uh, inertia behind it. It confuses, it calls things races, which we don't think are races. I don't even like the word race. Um, uh, it, it uses color for some purposes, legal status for other purposes, uh, origin, nationality. I mean, uh, you know, these, these are countries. They're not races, for heaven's sakes. Uh, uh, China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam. Uh, then there's this language thing that's mixed up in there, and that takes care of the Hispanics and so forth and so on. I think it's a mess. And I'll, I'll quickly say what, and then we'll. Um, but it's a mess only because it doesn't sort of map on the population that, that currently lives in this country. It's a mess because we're not even sure what purpose it has. And it's carrying along in its track three really separate important purposes, and they don't sort of match. One purpose is, of course, discrimination, racial disparities, uh, and the capacity of a country to track uh, disparities, and uh, the effects of, of slavery, the effects of, of genocide, and its treatment of the American Indian population, and so forth. Secondly, this question is used heavily to try to sort out which new population groups are assimilating successfully into American mainstream society. The assimilation, the culturation, uh, the immigrant population, the surge of immigration after the uh, 1960s and so forth. And third, though it isn't clear, but again, the panelists will, will confirm this. This is also a question about self-identity, about you being what you want to be. And if you want to be two or three things, write them all down. And indeed, the congressional hearings that put the some other Mark one or more box into the census question was a congressional hearing that stressed the right of groups to have affirmation, representation. So this has got a social psychological dimension. It's got a, a map the population, uh, the culturation, assimilation, new America dimension. And then it's got the, the, uh, the lingering effects of discrimination, of racial disparities, and so forth. And I think my argument, quickly, is that this particular question, even combined with the Hispanic question, can't carry the policy weight that we're assigning to it. And the American people is getting, are getting a little frustrated. We were just chatting uh, a bit ago, the number of people who are now on the, on the, on the right who are saying that uh, answer the question, but don't answer the race question. Uh, answer the census in, in 2000, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, but don't answer the, the race question. This question has also led to a colorblind movement in American society. Take it out completely. Don't even ask about race. It gives us all these race-based policies. We don't like those and so forth. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court is on record saying he doesn't like the fact that the American, society, American people are being put in all these little boxes uh, and that we ought to get past that. A lot of complicated politics behind this thing. My own quick argument is that we should change that question completely to something that I'm not going to present. First time ever in public. Uh, it's true. Uh, uh, and uh, we'll sort of see what my colleagues think about it. I do think this society continues to have a serious problem with racial disparities and that they are uh, uh, rooted in a nasty political history, especially targeted to two population groups, the African-American slaves, of course, and American Indians. And that we should simply ask a question, are you or are you not? African American. Are you or are you not Native American Indian? And that we ought to continue to track social racial justice, discriminatory politics, or policies using the answers to these two questions. And anybody who is neither of those things, and you can also be 
African American and something else, can be a Indian and something else. But anyone who is not those kinds of things is just in some other big blob. That would include us, the Asians, and so forth and so on. Then I would get much, much more refined data on national origin and length of time in the country. How long have you been here? Uh, where were your parents born? Have they ever lived here? Maybe even get a grandparent uh, dimension to this, go back two or three generations. I would use this question to uh, track the pace at which people are assimilating, acculturating, getting educated, getting health care, intermarrying, you know, whatever. And, uh, and so in a sense, it's a national origin question, not a race question. It's a national origin question. And you see, I, I wouldn't even use the word race in this question, nor would have I used it in the prior question. And then finally, because there are complicated pockets uh, where we still have to worry about disparities that aren't just sort of driven maybe by national origin, but are really driven by something of a, of a racial sort or an ethnic sort, I would ask a big open-ended question, just tell us who you are and uh, your origin, your ethnicity, your tribe, your race, your ancestry. You know, I don't know. Just mix all those terms up and just tell us what you are. It can be mixtures. And that would then allow the country to identify small population groups outside of the African-American descendants of state. For example, the way the question now word is worded, the recent immigrant, the Somalia or Ethiopian Islamic Nilotic, who comes to this country, has only been in this country for 10 or 15 years, has kids in the school, has no place to go except the African American category. If they don't go there, the Census Bureau is going to put them there. Uh, in all likelihood, and I, I can explain how we do that in a second. Fundamentally, there's no place for that person to go. Here, that person would find themselves. They would put down, I'm, I'm Ethiopian. Um, uh, if they wanted to, or what have you. Um, so this question would allow everybody in the country to present themselves the way they see themselves along some dimension of, of, of ethnicity, tribe, origin, ancestry. Uh, I, I didn't put the word language in there, but I could have put language in there and so forth. These haven't been pre-tested. These aren't official questions. They're trying to get the notational idea of, of what I think. What would accomplish, I think what would be accomplished uh, and I mentioned at the bottom here that we already get information on language citizenship from other questions. What I think this would accomplish would one, we would continue to be able to address the consequences of what happened to uh, the African Americans, the Africans who were enslaved, and then subjected Jim Crow legislation, and not not for uh, not until 1960s and beginning to imagine themselves as, as, as free citizens of this country with civil rights. Um, we, we would continue to, be able to track the legacy of that, that history and continue to track the legacy of, 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 of the mistreatment of the American Indian population. And then we would pick up whether there are certain origin groups, new immigrants who are coming here from certain countries are not doing very well and try to figure out what those reasons are. And then we would have a sweeping kind of everybody um, a kind of question for affirmation, for representation, and so forth but also um, uh, to see if you could learn some other kinds of things that would allow you to examine disparities and, and have policy responses uh, to that. So we're now going to shift from me to them. But I'm gonna, I'll leave the question up. Um, what order do you want to talk? <laughs> yeah, no, no. You can, you can grade them. Is this yeah. garbage? Is that garbage? <laughs> oh, sure. Sorry. Yeah, I did. I went to the nearest microphone. Okay. Well, we now have um, on the table a little bit of policy history um, and a policy proposal um, about uh, about racial categories in the United States Census, which is. I think critically um, a, a place where uh, where this, um, where where policy knowledge that is uh, 
knowledge that we derive from complex statistical systems um, that are that are um, that that are deployed and analyzed in the United States government by statisticians and by by sophisticated uh, politically neutral policy analysts, as uh, um, where that system meets politics, um, where that system meets um, 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 and comes into contact with um, with complicated questions about how things happen in American government. Um, so to respond to the uh, to um, to Ken's uh, little uh, mini uh, lecture, we have three uh, very distinguished uh, colleagues. Um, from uh, my right to my left, um, Angelo Falcone. Angelo is a political scientist um, and the president of the National Institute for Latino Policy. Um, he's a very uh, distinguished and prominent analyst of policy and politics surrounding the Latino community in the United States, a leading uh, organizer of and advocate for um, the Latino community in the United States. Um, to my immediate left, we have Nate Persley, who is a professor of law and political science here at Columbia. Um, a leading expert on uh, the law and politics of elections in the United States, um, including the issue uh, issues surrounding um, the drawing of legislative districts, redistricting, um, uh, all of which uh, all of uh, which relies very centrally and critically on census data, um, uh, and uses the kind of data that Ken was describing um, intensively um, uh, to think about issues of, um, to deal with issues of representation, representation of communities, however defined, um, defined by law, defined by politics, defined by policy in, uh, in politics. Um, and uh, to Nate's left is Ted Shaw, also a professor at Columbia Law School, um, who came to Columbia a few years ago after a very long and distinguished career um, at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, probably the preeminent um, uh, civil rights uh, legal organization in the United States. Um, and he was the president of the Legal Defense Fund uh, for several years before, um, um, uh, before coming to Columbia. So I'm going to ask uh, each of uh, our panelists, Angelo, Nate, and Ted, to uh, respond in whatever way they want to Ken's presentation in five minutes or so. Um, and then we'll open it up to a discussion both among uh, the people at the table and, um, and you all. So let's start with Angela. Uh, let's see. When I, I uh, met Dr. Pruitt, first time is uh, he had just gotten confirmed uh, to be director of the census, the year 2000 census, and uh, they had this reception for him, and he shocked the hell out of me because uh, he got up and he, he said, you know, he said all the nice things, but then he said, you know, I've been consulting with the guys in South Africa that are setting up the new government, and they're putting together the census over there, and I told them, don't put the race question in, because it's going to create more problems for, for your country if you put the question in. And I said, holy shit, this guy's going to be messing around with the race and Hispanic question. These people in Washington, they're driving me crazy, because we just spent all this time lobbying for these stupid things to make sure that, you know, they, they're included. Uh, but uh, one of the, the, the problems uh, with, uh, I think, Ken's presentation is that it's, 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 it's like, rational. <laughs> and it's, this thing doesn't work. I mean, think about how we got to the point where we have this mishmash of, uh, you know, uh, kinds of question uh, that's based on uh, congressional testimony, scientific surveys, people tested these questions up and down and all that stuff, and this is decades, and you wind up with this stuff, which is like confusing as hell, uh, and which is, uh, you know, uh, of limited value in some areas, you know, uh, this multi, multiple choice uh, race thing, to me, it was a total waste of time. I was like, two, three percent of the people check that stuff off. I don't know what the hell you do with those numbers. You know, it's just a bunch of categories uh, that you basically just uh, uh, brush aside and say, look, we're going to focus on single race, the people uh, in terms of Voting Rights Act and all of these kinds of things. So the politics of this is so intertwined that it's really difficult to have a rational discussion. And then, as, as I think Ken mentioned, uh, the question of the role of race in American society is something that is, is a hotly debated issue uh, about the continuing relevance of, of, of the race questions and the Hispanic questions. Now, I can tell you politically what happens. I, I'm also chair of the uh, Census Advisory Committee on the Hispanic Population, uh, and we have a black, uh, you know, the categories each have a committee. And uh, what happens when these numbers are, you know, when we, uh, these, uh, these things are tested is the bottom line is not are these things rational, but uh, which 
a combination of questions or order of questions yields the most number for your group. So uh, right now, for example, there are some people that are trying to uh, raise consciousness with Afro-Latinos, and they're telling people who are dark-skinned Latinos to make sure, check off black on the race question. Well, I know the reaction is going to be in the black community, wait a minute, you're taking away our blacks, our black numbers, uh, to include them in the Hispanic category. And that's part of the politics here in terms of, of these questions. Now, they're, they're, uh, right now, uh, in the 2010 census, they're going to be um, testing these questions, different combinations of these things. Uh, uh, not quite what uh, Ken laid out there, but similar in terms of uh, uh, looking at things like combining the Hispanic with the race qu uh, questions into one, one, one uh, question. That's one thing. Uh, it, 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 things like you also testing the, the, the race question about in terms of African Americans blacks and you know they're going to be testing what happens if you take out the Negro this is you know the, you, you saw the controversy around inclusion of the term Negro in that question so right now there's the testing that's going to be occurring and so this debates they're going to start up again uh, at the beginning uh, past the, you know the 2010 census in terms of the research that the uh, Census Bureau is going to be doing in terms of looking at how these different combinations of the questions uh, different wording of the questions including not a, not using for example the, the word race in the question and see what that does uh, but the politics of this is the tough part uh, that uh, you know people are going to be looking at bottom lines in terms of uh, numbers uh, for their community uh, people have uh, have vested interests, different uh, groups, in making sure that they're well represented in the census. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of suspicion. Uh, when we received the, the first report last year from the group that at the Census Bureau, the staff, that they were going to be testing the question, just testing the question during the 2010 census, uh, most of the members of the committee are Mexican American. I'm the only Puerto Rican. And then there's a Salvadorian woman. Uh, and we're sitting there, and um, I just got on re relatively new on the committee scared the hell out of me. The members of the committee almost threw the, the census staff people out the door. They were like enraged that they're testing these questions after all the time we spent during the, 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 in the last 10 years lobbying for these questions. Now they're going to test them again and maybe change them. Holy shit. I mean, they just jumped all over them. I, I said, whoa, my God. And it really shook them up. So there's this kind of, kind of uh, visceral kind of reaction to this stuff as well. Uh, that has to do with suspicion, why are they doing this, uh, has to do with the politics of it, will Latinos uh, be counted less because of these shifts, uh, and that kind of, I think, overtakes the discussion rather than uh, the rationality. By the way, I was very um, uh, uh, happy to see the uh, Beavis and Budhead uh, reaction you guys had to the uh, Eupenis thing. I think it was, <laughs> it was encouraging. Thanks very much, Angela. Hey. <laughs> How does one Talk follow that? that? Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you for having me here. Uh, let, let me start by also making a pitch for uh, my course over on, in the other uh, building for you all, since I don't get SEPA students, which is uh, I teach a class on law and politics, particularly uh, uh, regulation of elections and things like that. We talk about redistricting, voting rights, um, political parties, campaign finance, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, it would be great to have some of you take it in the fall. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it dovetails with a lot of your interests in this. And I come uh, here today wearing multiple hats, as is often the case when I uh, talk about the census and um, racial categories, which is that I'm a law professor, I'm a political scientist, and I'm a, someone who, uh, who uses the data, uh, particularly as, as someone who draws legislative districts. So I've been appointed on several occasions by courts to draw um, redistricting maps for Congress and state legislatures, some, some that are even in effect. And I'll tell you some stories from that. Um, let, me, let me start with, um, j just to give you a sense of what, how the data, census data are used uh, by those of us uh, in the business. Um, as Ken mentioned, there, there were 63 potential racial combinations uh, from the last census because of the multiple race checkoff. That actually understates it because there are 126 once you add in whether someone is Hispanic or not. Uh, and so you describe every level of census geography from the smallest block up to the state level uh, along those racial categories. But um, as Ken mentioned, the OMB uh, developed guidelines for re-aggregating back into six races or five races. And, uh, and my takeaway, uh, or, or what I should say, one thing I want to um, 
suggest here is that the actual question is a little bit less important than how we aggregate the race afterwards, what we do with the data in terms of describing the population. So, for example, if you're going to have a catch-all category at the end, why not just, why don't we scrap the whole enterprise and, and if we think that we, we have a good job, we can do a good job at aggregating the data into certain categories, why not just say, describe your race, right, to everyone. Forget about what the specific questions for African American or Indian, et cetera. You just say, you know, what is, describe your race slash ethnicity, right? And if we believe that the census can um, sort of take those handwritten descriptions and then uh, so the computers, for the most part, can re-aggregate back into uh, certain racial groups uh, or do it in several different ways, well, then that, that could sort, uh, sort of solve the problem. But one thing that, that I would also urge is that in developing policy in this area, we should avoid the attractiveness of conceptual neatness and uh, sort of self-expression. That in designing the race question and um, pushing policy in this area, that, that primarily we should decide what goals we want the data to serve, right, and then develop the question in order to achieve that. Uh, and so it is true that uh, the data are used for many purposes, and the politics around it do have this uh, feeling of uh, competition uh, for self-expression as well as for, um, you know, sort of see which groups are, are larger than the others. But um, principally, I, I view the census race question as useful first, as Ken said, to evaluate discrimination claims, and I'll talk about that in a second and how that happens. Uh, and then also it's critical um, I mean, we don't just use census data for redistricting, federal funding, et cetera. It, it describes the American population, and anybody who does research, um, not only into race, but even something as simple as, as polling design, right? Any other poll that we run, election polls, uh, uses the census as its baseline in order to stratify the U.S. population and to uh, sort of set benchmarks in order to uh, get accurate uh, impressions about people's opinions across a range of areas. So let me just say two things about this. So first, uh, as, as Ken said, there, there, it is relevant um, that census data are used for civil rights enforcement. Now, but how, how does that happen? Um, the, it, it, across different areas of the law, we often need to uh, measure the impact, right, of a particular law policy decision on racial groups. And so uh, it's not, a, sometimes it's very easy to measure, you know, to find sort of smoking on gun evidence of racist intent or something like that, but that's, that's often quite rare. Uh, you have to figure out the impact that a decision or policy is having on, on specific uh, groups. In the context of redistricting and the Voting Rights Act, that means often that you ask the question whether the districts are drawn in such a way as to uh, deny to a racial group its equal opportunity to elect candidates of its choice. Right? That's the Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and those, um, that has often led then to uh, judges and the courts uh, ordering the redrawing of districts in order to ensure that, for example, we have majority minority <laughs> districts in areas where uh, we think that, that the Voting Rights Act requires it. Um, in order to evaluate the impact right, of a redistricting plan, you have to know something about the population. That's the same is true with an employment decision, right? If an employer uh, has a workforce that is only 10% African American, but you know from the census that 50% of the surrounding community is African American, right, that will be useful in trying to assess the impact of a particular uh, policy, right, and to allege uh, that there might be uh, some discrimination that's going on there. Um, so the, the truth is, this, the, this reordering of the question is not terrible, it, it doesn't really make much of a difference in terms of uh, the, the way you, you've done it in terms of civil rights enforcement, so long as we can now identify uh, the communities who are African American, American Indian, uh, Hispanic. Um, of course, it's a political non-starter uh, for reasons that, that Ken sort of expressed and Angelo did, um, uh, because, you know, it has, particularly with the Hispanic, independent Hispanic question on the census, that has become um, a real uh, symbol of 
well, it, it has demonstrated the rise in the uh, Hispanic community in the United States and has become a sort of a critical, I think, uh, a symbolic win in some ways for um, uh, that community on the census form itself. Uh, nevertheless, at the same time, I think there's no real reason to separate out African Americans, American Indians, and not have a Hispanic, if you're going to have those separate categories in the earlier question. Uh, and it remains the case that Hispanics are, uh, in terms of comprising the universe of civil rights claims that you get, are not only are they increasing in the size of the population, but they are, um, when you're talking about whether it's Title VII kind of litigation or redistricting litigation for sure, uh, increasingly they're going to be the plaintiffs. Uh, and so to, to take them out and treat them uh, differently doesn't seem to me to, to further anything, although I understand there might be some kind of conceptual reasons why one might think that's the right thing to do. Um, I think that probably if, if you're going, if, if one is concerned about tracking the legacies of discrimination, that you'd probably keep it in there. Um, now, in, in terms of uh, usefulness for research, I mean, there's a lot in here that you, that you propose that I think is helpful. I mean, the ancestry kinds of questions serve a whole different purpose that the census isn't, um, really isn't, the, the short form of the census is not helping with right now. Um, but we could think of all kinds of questions that we might want to put on the short form of the census. Uh, there isn't a citizenship question, right, on the census, so we don't know who an American citizen is and who isn't. There are good reasons why we don't want to do that because if you if you make this, you know, uh, uh, if, if there's any potential deterrent effect, right, for people filling out the census um, because of uh, the fear that INS would get a hold of it, um, then that would chill participation. Uh, but, you know, we've, it used, when Ken was running the census, they had the long form of the census, which was sent out to one out of every six Americans. Now they do a small sample of three million people every year, asking them every type of question about where they live. They ask them about citizenship. They ask them about ancestry, et cetera. Uh, and so I, th these questions on, on ancestry, I think, are, are very uh, interesting and, and also sort of raise the question as to what other kinds of information do we want from the population at large? Because, to be honest, the, the fact that I think, you can correct me, Ken, if I'm wrong, is that what, three-fifths of the actual short form right now is dedicated to race, something like that? So that is the only, so the majority of the information or the space on a census form that the, that the U.S. population is getting um, just deals with race. And there aren't there other things that we would like to, to know as well? Um, I'll end. Uh, I guess just by by suggesting, you know, that, the, and, and this is something I don't know enough about, we should think about all the other areas of research where we use racial categories. So the even medical research, right, uses the census racial categories to track um, progression of diseases in certain communities, et cetera. And that when you know more about how different constituent groups uh, who use the data uh, would like to see the racial question posed, that that is also a way to get information on how to, to formulate the, the next uh, census race question. Thanks, Nate. Ted? Well, <clears throat> I, um, I want to start by uh, agreeing with Ken with respect to uh, the big picture, which is that uh, the census uh, and the way the census talks about the, the issue of identity, who we are, is a mess. Uh, that's clear. Uh, I also want to add that it's no more a mess, in my view, than uh, this country's jurisprudence uh, on race, particularly as having been defined by the Supreme Court. Um, and um, there's a strong connection uh, between these two sets of messes, uh, if, you, if you allow me. Uh, so uh, I think it's very important to be much more deliberate and careful about terminology and how we use terminology when we talk about what we call race uh, in this country. Uh, because we do, in many respects, um, uh, confuse and conflate uh, race, color, national origin, um, uh, ethnicity, uh, 
uh, and we talk about them as if they're all interchangeable, and they are not. Uh, my view, for example, on the use of the term white, which kind of stands out in uh, some of the, uh, in one of the slides in particular, uh, which uh, refers to all the other groups in terms of either ethnicity or national origin, and then there's white. Uh, you know, I think we need to think about, and a lot of people have begun to think about it, what whiteness means. What purpose does that category serve? I understand European American. Uh, I also understand whiteness. Uh, to the, and I think being white historically in this country, and much more than we want to acknowledge now, still serves one purpose. Uh, and that is white supremacy. It is oppositional. If you think about being white, uh, and I see some of you exchanging looks, but I want you to think about this. If you think about being white, what does it mean except distinguishing a category of people who are of European ancestry from everybody else? Uh, you know, it's kind of like a case that uh, I remember uh, working on involving scholarships for African American students that were declared unconstitutional at the University of Maryland. Um, and during the time that we were litigating this case at the Legal Defense Fund, we looked and we found all kinds of scholarships in this country that were, in effect, national origin or uh, ethnically based or gender based, et cetera. We found scholarships for uh, descendants of French Huguenots. Uh, we found scholarships for uh, Italian students uh, from upstate New York. Uh, we found scholarships for um, uh, uh, students um, uh, who are uh, from China in the United States or of Chinese ancestry. Uh, we found scholarships for young women of good, high moral character who did not use tobacco. Uh, uh, and uh, all these scholarships. Now, stay with me for a minute on this. Uh, my view was that I had no problem with scholarships for students of Italian descent uh, from upstate New York. I don't think those scholarships were created for the purpose of discriminating against everyone else in the sense of saying that they were inferior. Italian Americans uh, got together, proud of their, um, uh, their national origin, et cetera, uh, funded these scholarships. I don't see that uh, in the same way I would see a scholarship for white students. Uh, and some people say, well, the symmetry is you have a scholarship for African American students or black students. Uh, so uh, why do you allow that? You don't allow scholarship for black students, uh, or white students, rather. Well, the answer is uh, you have to look at our history and what whiteness means and what it means to be black or African American, and the fact that, for the most part, except for recent immigrants from Africa, uh, for black people in this country, uh, you know, it's hard to find uh, out, or it has been hard. Now we, we have more science. We can do it a little bit better. But race has been ethnicity. Um, so we conflate all of these things. I could spend a lot more time talking about it, but my, my main point here is that I agree that it's a mess. Having said all that, um, uh, I think that uh, I want to focus on a few points. One, and, and um, uh, Professor Persley, Nate has already laid out the legitimate uses, in my view, of uh, tracking what we call race or ethnicity, or identity, or whatever we call it. Uh, but I think we need to be more specific about what we're talking about. But there are legitimate reasons. And uh, to know who we are uh, as a country is still important. Uh, it's still important in so many different ways. Uh, people like uh, you mentioned before the uh, panel, Glenn Beck, they rail on the right against uh, these uh, census categories, and they say, don't answer. The race question uh, is being counting, and they equate any race consciousness with racism. And that's a false equation. I can talk a lot more about that. Uh, we do have to be careful about how we use what we call race or ethnicity or national origin, but the equation of race consciousness or you know, ethnicity consciousness uh, with racism uh, is uh, a false equation on its face. Um, a lot more that we could say about that. Uh, you know, uh, I've litigated voting rights cases 
I've litigated every kind of civil rights case there is by now. And uh, I understand how important it is to uh, use evidence that relies in part on these classifications as Professor Persley talked about. Now, a um, uh, couple of other points uh, about systemic issues. One is that um, your proposal in part and the way it deals with uh, Latinos or Hispanics. Um, and Latinos or Hispanics, uh, you know, it's a broad categorization uh, and uh, it really, uh, in some respects, masks many subgroups. And the same thing is true for Asian Americans. We're going to be honest about it, the same true thing is true for African Americans now, with more and more immigration of Africans into the United States, uh, first generation or second generation Africans, or people of African descent from the Caribbean. So even though we have this this um, old and enduring issue uh, that is rooted in slavery and Jim Crow segregation that only ended about 40 years ago, uh, if we're going to be honest about it, uh, and that legacy, legacy still reaches into our policies and our, our status today, uh, it's much more complicated than um, uh, it would be if we were to simply look at uh, you know, African Americans is one homogeneous group. Uh, but um, uh, let me shift for a minute and, uh, and close by saying something on a somewhat personal level, that, but, but only for the purpose of illustrating what we're talking about here, okay? So I sit here in front of you, a very light-skinned person who some of you, if you looked at me, you might say, well, I'm not sure what his ethnicity is. Uh, I'm an African-American, but obviously I am not solely African-American. You know, I took one of these tests not long ago. Uh, Skip Gates up at Harvard encouraged me to take one of these tests. You know, he's making money off of this <laughs> stuff. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, one test came back and, and, and traced Native American ancestry. Many African-Americans claim it. Uh, not all have it, I do. Uh, uh, but also, uh, you could look at me and you might say, well, maybe his parents are, uh, you know, in an interracial or biracial marriage. Uh, no. And in fact, in my family, as light-skinned as I am, my first cousins are dark-skinned, uh, but we had no idea who any of the white people were in my family, going back uh, as long as anybody had a memory or those who knew, as we say in the African-American community, those who know don't tell and those who tell don't know. Uh, so if people knew, they weren't telling. Um, and uh, I did some work this summer, uh, and I'm continuing on this work, uh, and finally did find a white ancestor going back to uh, the Revolutionary War, uh, who was uh, a, uh, a, uh, an orphan, fought in the Revolutionary War, came back from the war uh, blind uh, to Virginia, uh, and in a, uh, a scenario that tempts one to uh, think about, um, uh, who, what's the African-American comedian uh, who had this, Dave Chappelle. Uh, and, and some of you know the skit I'm talking about, right? Uh, if you don't know, you can talk to somebody next to you and they can explain it afterwards. Uh, but he married, not married, he couldn't marry, it was illegal, but he lived with a, with, with a, a woman of African descent. Uh, she was designated mulatto. Uh, and undoubtedly, uh, you know, she was mulatto because some slave master had taken liberties with her, to put it kindly. Um, which is the way, I think, as I, best as I understand it, most of the blood in me that is European by origin came into my family. I don't know of anybody who married somebody white except for this individual who couldn't marry. Uh, the point I'm making is that in spite of all of that, not knowing, and knowing all that now, my identity, my experience, uh, where I grew up, the way I live, my interests has all been defined as African American when in fact uh, I'm probably America in many ways. Um, uh, but if the census were to uh, allow uh, a change which would take people who either look like me and many African Americans because of the internalization of racism still want to be anything else but African Americans. 
some African, many African Americans are now proud to be African Americans. But I'm not in favor of uh, eliminating uh, a categorization process which allows us to count African Americans because of all the reasons that Professor Persley talked about. Uh, so uh, the bottom line, though, is that this ends up being deeply personal for many Americans, who and what they are and who they claim and what they claim. Uh, many of us don't even know entirely what we, what we are. Uh, we're making an election, uh, or an election has been made for us. I suspect in time uh, this will only become more and more muddled, and in time we may end up with uh, a census form which allows people to make the kind of elections that you talk about. Uh, but we still, in this country, and this is the final thing I'll say, we still have a particular legacy. And this is where the jurisprudence is screwed up. American jurisprudence denies the peculiar experience of African Americans. Uh, that is, it denies the peculiarity of that experience. Uh, as a constitutional matter, it doesn't recognize it. Uh, and you mentioned the peculiar experience of Native Americans. There are still some particular issues that need to be worked out uh, because of that legacy. And I'm not ready to abandon that, even though uh, the ideologues who are uh, chumping in colorblindness now, having hijacked it and turned it on its head, uh, are using it against all kinds of attempt to pursue uh, an agenda that continues to address the legacy of inequality rooted in racism, uh, slavery, and uh, Jim Crow segregation. All right, thanks to all three of you. What I want to do now is um, I want to ask a couple of questions um, to the panelists that have, based on things that have come up in the discussion. Um, and I'll ask if Ken can jump in on these things too, and then we'll, we'll go around on the panel a little bit, um, and then we'll, we'll take questions from, from you all as, as they come up. But the first thing I want to do is, is pick up on something Nate said, and that is you put out the proposition that what we need to do when we're thinking about the census in this particular instance, but I think about any sort of data collection enterprise for policy purposes is think about the purpose to which we want to put the data. What do we want to use the data for? And that the answer to that question should guide um, the way we construct the data system and construct the evidence that we're collecting. Um, each of you talked a little bit around this question, but I'd like each of you, including Ken, to answer this quest answer the question. What's the purpose for which we should be using these racial categories as we measure them in the census? Um, let's just go down the table and ask, ask Angela to start to ask, answer that. Well, I mean, it's, it's from uh, straightforward, as uh, people mentioned, to trying to look at disparities and where they, they basically uh, uh, show discrimination. Uh, that's an issue, but the problem is that people are uh, right now politically trying to turn that on its head in terms of uh, how you can p potentially use the, these data. Uh, you know, you have a, uh, if I want to get a major policy uh, maker like really bored and stuff, you know, you know when you talk to somebody and like their eyes start floating like in front of you and stuff, is when I talk about uh, discrimination and, and these disparity issues, they go, oh man, we got to talk about that, that's all you have to talk about. There are some uh, agencies, for example, the uh, Federal Communications Committee uh, Commission used to ask the uh, broadcast television stations to submit uh, breakdowns of the, uh, of the workforce. Uh, uh, over 10 years ago, they stopped doing doing that because I guess I don't know. It was uh, the Supreme Court found that it was discriminatory to have this information. So now uh, we can't enforce, we can't gauge uh, what kind of progress we're making uh, in terms of diversifying the, the broadcast television stations. Except you know, you watch on the tube and you see more Hispanics and stuff like that. But the guys who make the decisions behind the camera, we sometimes have no idea. So just kind of monitoring this kind of stuff is 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 uh, really important at a very basic level. Level, or things like voting rights, so when we talk about redistricting, it's based on the notion of that there's a racially polarized electorate out there. And all you have to do is, is look at the results of the 2008 election uh, racially, and you see at the, even at the national level how polarized
surprised it was. Uh, all you have to do is read, do a Google thing and put down, uh, you know, racial discrimination or whatever, and you'll see report after report every, on all health, housing, and you see these kinds of racial disparities in this country uh, consistently. Uh, the pro so, I, I, the, the, you know, we're able to document this stuff. The problem is the interpretation of doc that documentation. Uh, it's uh, over the years what's been happening, especially under the Bush administration, is that that stuff has been turned into kind of blame the victim kind of thing. And no longer looking at kind of structural inequalities because the data doesn't, it's hard to make those kind of connections. So, so it's, it's not a question so much of the data, but the interpretation of the data these days. Uh, also the fact that um, I, I'd say under the Bush administration there was a tremendous effort to kind of uh, really weaken the enforced civil rights enforcement power of the federal of the federal government and these agencies. So these data were not taken as seriously as they should have when you see the kind of consistency uh, of, of the kind of patterns that you see there. But again, the question is, is kind of uh, uh, one of uh, basically your interpretation of those disparities. Is it really the result of kind of a racism, a structural problems, or is it an individual problem? These people just, you know, can't keep jobs and stuff like that. So it, 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 it makes it really difficult, I think, to, to kind of talk about this uh, uh, these days. And then there are these other uses, for example, in the Latino community, uh, just the idea of affirming the existence of the community. Uh, when we talk about the census now, you know, people talk about the benefits of the census in terms of, you know, more money's coming into your neighborhoods, uh, uh, that kind of thing, or, you know, reapportionment. Uh, but also in the Latino community, I always tell people it kind of reintroduces the Latino community every 10 years to American society and generates a whole discussion. That's something that, that is, is valued very much in the community, uh, uh, just, just that acknowledgement uh, and the fact that it's growing. So we get people in the com Latino community, oh my God, we're growing, there's so many Latinos now. Then you get the other part of the U.S. going, holy shit, there's too many Latinos now. And it starts a, a, a very interesting conversation every 10 years. So, so let me just follow up before we move on. Given that set of purposes that you have to come out of these data, what is your optimal classification system and set of questions on the census look like? Do we have it, is the question that we have now the right one? Should we change it somehow, either in the direction that Ken is suggesting or, or some other direction? If you could write the question as the, you know, census dictator, what would you do? Well, you know, right now, uh, unfortunately, uh, looking at the positives, I've sat down with Ken a few times, and I've kind of uh, said, oh, it makes sense, but then I'm looking, looking at the politics of it, and for the Latino community, it was a battle to get this kind of recognition. Uh, and right now, man, we got our own question. <laughs> I don't know, who's gonna mess with that? So you, leave, so you wanna leave it alone? Yeah, I'm, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Nate, all right, so as I said, so both, both questions, what, what are the purposes and, yeah. and what's, the, what's the right question to ask? So the, the, as I was saying, so the purpose, I, I sort of split the purposes into two, which is one for the law and the other is for research. Um, and uh, so for the law, as I said, the Voting Rights Act, I mean, all civil rights statutes in some way are, um, they, they necessitate the use of some kind of racial category uh, or, or racial data. Uh, and then um, in particular, you know, you look at the Voting Rights Act, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, uh, Fair Housing Act, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess ed certainly education uh, policy and, and desegregation, right? You need to know the racial composition of who lives where in order to make assessments of how uh, integrated a uh, community may be and how, um, or, or segregated and how uh, certain laws will affect those populations, right? Um, also, obviously, for affirmative action, I mean, adding on to the civil rights laws, you need to, uh, if not with the census, you'll need it with other, um, other surveys as well and other application forms, uh, et cetera. So those are the legal requirements. Uh, then what about for research? This I'm, I'm a little bit less sure of because one can only speak from one's field, you know, uh, and so I think you'd get a different, and, and Ken and I actually years ago were part of a symposium at Bard College where we had all kinds of different uh, scholars from different fields talking about the multiple race checkoff option on the census and how it would have an impact for their research. So, you know, doctors would have uh, a different idea as to what, how, what racial categorization would help them. Um, political scientists might have other ideas. And, and pollsters, as I said, are, are important in this 
uh, realm as well to get a sense of, of what kind of information will help them describe the population in a way so that they can then... And evidently, uh, the people who make television shows, it's important to them. Yes, yes, right, right. So you can market, market research, right, all of that. Um, I mean, just to give you an example, of, I mean, I filed a Supreme Court brief last year that used census data, um, uh, which was, this was on the constitutional challenge of the Voting Rights Act. And, you know, one of the questions that was raised in the case was to what extent Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act is a piece of legislation that only applies to some parts of the country and not others. And so in the first page of the brief of those who are challenging the Constitution of the Voting Rights Act, they say, look, we have a black president. Um, the Voting Rights Act means something very different now than it did 40 years ago. Uh, and, and obviously the Obama election was, was mentioned as something that, that uh, you know, raised concerns among um, those who were challenging the constitutionality of the Voting Rights Act. And so one of the things we could show, right, was just doing some simple bivariate plots of the race of, say, um, the, the, the population breakdown of uh, counties on the x-axis, right, and the uh, Obama's uh, vote share on the y-axis, right? Now, you need census data in order to do that. And what you could show, for example, is that, um, that Obama did not do as well among whites in the areas that are covered uh, by the Voting Rights Act as he did outside the covered jurisdictions. And not only did that sort of seems obvious because most of the areas that are covered are the South, so of course he's, you know, he's going to do worse among Southern whites. But then you could also compare it to go four years prior and compare, well, how, how much better or worse did he do among whites than John Kerry, right? Turns out he did do better than among whites than John Kerry did four years early outside of the areas that are covered by the Voting Rights Act, but he didn't. Uh, in the areas that were covered by the Voting Rights Act. Right? Unless you have census data where you can match up, um, you know, the counties or the districts or the blocks racial uh, or, or precincts uh, racial composition with, say, the vote percentages that certain candidates get, you can't make those kind of arguments. Oh, and, oh, and what, what, what I, I said, you know, as I said about the, the what question I would like, I, I, I'm the, the format of the question is not as critical for me as, as to what data then are prepared by the Census Bureau to, that they give you. So, so if we can operationalize uh, Ken's last question, which is sort of an open-ended question, right, and say, well, describe your race, right, then, the, all right, then we're going to have some kind of um, heuristic, right, as to how we're going to then recategorize people already. Now, that, that, that's what we have under the some other, as Ken was hinting in his talk, on the some other race category. The census will take people out of the, the some other race category and reallocate them to other racial groups. Um, and so this, you know, if you just have an open-ended question, it allows for self-expression if that's important to people. But then the question is, how would we uh, reallocate people afterwards? Ken? I don't have much to add to what uh, Nate has already said about the uses of uh, these data uh, and to what I said earlier about the, the uses of these data. I think that the data is still very important and it's a terrible mistake to equate the collection of data um, with uh, discrimination itself. Uh, it's, uh, that's a terrible mistake, uh, but some people are doing that very deliberately. Um, with respect to uh, the questions, uh, as I uh, said earlier, or at least I hinted, uh, I probably would be okay with the elimination of the term race uh, and the use of, of, uh, of ethnicity or national origin, uh, those kinds of terms. Uh, race uh, is very confusing, uh, ultimately, and as we know, uh, it is a social construct, uh, but it is a very, very powerful social construct in this country. Uh, so, um, uh, I, as I said before, I would be in favor of being very, very conscious and deliberate about the terminology we're using and exactly uh, what we're trying to, um, uh, to, to measure. All right, before we go on to another round of this, Ken, so well, you want to respond uh, to these pot shots? 
No, I, I won't. I mean, it's too important to get the conversation going than me go, go down the line. I, I, just a couple of small things, uh, really, uh, for your edification, so to speak. Um, the, um, uh, certainly, the, the, um, what Angelo said about the importance of the size of one's group is, is a big deal. And uh, there is no doubt but that over the last 20 or 30 years, the Hispanics have done a better job at sort of, I don't want to overstate this, but of, of using the census as a tool, uh, a political tool, for affirmation of, of, of the group, for even some cohesion of the group, um, and certainly for parading the results in all kinds of political forum. The, the, um, the only group, whatever we call it, race group, ethnicity group, or whatever, the only group that's mentioned in any law that tells you you have to count this group is the Hispanic group. The law talks about all kinds of things. It talks about racial minorities. Uh, uh, it never talks about African Americans. The law itself about the census and what we count. Uh, there's all kinds of euf euphemisms, even in the United States Constitution. Uh, it's a long the, history of euphemisms. Yeah, euphemisms. <laughs> right. um, but, but there is a public law that says if you count anybody of an ethnic or racial or whatever national origin category, if you count anybody, you have to count Hispanics. Uh, and it was a brilliant, uh, uh, and, and very early. We're not back in the 1960s. And protecting the other line uh, is, is a part of that because uh, so many uh, Hispanics find it convenient to be able to go to that line and therefore not become one of the uh, primary races, even though we may put them back in those categories. But from their point of view, they've asserted their self uh, and their right. So the first point then is just to really underline what Angelo said, is there's a powerful um, uh, a political force between simply being large. And certainly, as, as Ted knows, didn't talk about it in this particular comments today, but um, the, the opposition of the NAACP uh, Legal Defense Fund and other, or, other ethnic groups and racial groups to the multiple race question, the, the, the addition of this mark one or more, was an argument that would dilute our numbers because an Amer African American white would somehow be in a different category and that would separate or reduce the number of, of, of African Americans in the census numbers. So there was a dilution of numbers uh, political argument. That, that's just one quick thing I want to emphasize and, and the importance of that from the point of view of the politics of all of this. Um, I would, uh, 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 Nate, say that um, I wouldn't at all, uh, I never intended to take Hispanics out of the, the, the strategy, um, and I just think we ought to get to Hispanics as a national origin question. Um, where did you come from? Where did your parents come from? How long have you been here? I would actually put it in a, if, if this panel were made up of immigration uh, uh, experts, uh, rather than, than uh, uh, racial justice experts, which is fundamentally what, 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 is, what is the case up here today, um, they would be much more interested in the national origin, how long have you been here, where were your, uh, were your parents here, and so forth and so on. Because there is a kind of a residue of, of, uh, of anxiety about the, uh, the, how we treat new Americans, how we treat new people who come to this country, and do we treat them as equally. Now, just one other small thing, the, um, uh, the, the back on the mess problem, the, the Asian category is particularly, particularly vexing. Because what you've got in the Asian, quote unquote, Asian population, the umbrella Asian population, is you've got um, incredible success stories, obviously, of, of, of Korean Americans, Japanese Americans, Chinese Americans. And then you've got groups that aren't making it very well at all, Vietnamese, Hmong, so forth, uh, uh, Southeast Asians. Um, so you got a category that you're trying to sort of deal with racial justice, and it just doesn't work. It simply doesn't work. If anything, uh, uh, if, 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 if you did colorblind, uh, identity blind uh, uh, admissions policies in higher education in California, just test scores, just meritocracy, well, I don't know, 87% Asian women at Berkeley. Um, uh, the only way to get diversity is make sure you don't have too many Asian women. Uh, but no, it's, it's, it's um, well, if you look at the test scores, you're looking at thousands of, of 800 scores in the SATs uh, in, in, in among Asian population groups. Um, and so you've got, a, you've, got a, you've got this kind of category called Asian, which from a racial justice point of view is, is carrying a lot of, 
funny stuff in it. That just doesn't work. Sorry, uh, I'll stop. I mean, I won't stop. I'll answer your question, Robert. Then I'll stop. <laughs> um, but, um, I think there are three big purposes, and I think it's absolutely true that you ought to start with a purpose and design the question. What's actually happened in the history of the racial classification system in the United States is we started with a classification, and then we went around founding different purposes for it. The three-fifths law, uh, the race science in the 19th century, discriminatory practices of eth uh, 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 immigration policy, and then on the positive side, uh, uh, the affirmative action, uh, civil rights laws, the Voting Rights Act, and so forth. But in each case, the category just kind of got reproduced and reproduced and reproduced, and it kept changing the purposes attached to it. And I think we've run out of steam on that. So I would start with three purposes that this country ought to deal with. The lingering effects of a very peculiar or particular type of, of, of maltreatment of groups because they were of a race group. Secondly, some better measure or metric of how well new Americans are doing by ethnicity or by national origin or by language group or whatever it is insofar as we think that's a deterrent to making your way in this society. And then third, some kind of affirmation. Uh, let, let people express themselves. What we will actually do with those data is a little unclear to me, other than obviously a lot of interesting research. I should just technically say that if you did have that broad open-ended question, just write down what you want to. The, the technical uh, capability of, of collecting those data and coding them is very good. We, we, we live in the American Indian question you write in your tribe. And in, even in the 2000 census, the technology has improved since then. The intelligent character recognition, optical recognition, um, our, our success rate was over 99%. The fantastic capacity of, of, of to sort of do that. So you could actually have that kind of thing and then have all kinds of interesting sort of that. But, but back to Robert's question, and according uh, uh, to me, you do want to start with what is the purpose? And then you ask yourself, what is the measurement strategy that allow you to reach that purpose? Um, and uh, that's the rational argument, uh, linear policy making uh, uh, wonk in me. But the other half of me says, well, Angelo's right. <laughs> You're not going to get there. And therefore, you better try to come up with something you might be able to get to. I just want to say uh, one thing, which is uh, just so people aren't under misimpression, which is that um, the census race question has undergone incredible changes. Um, I mean, uh, that's obvious given, given you know, uh, the origins where you, it was principally uh, trying to d decide how much, you know, uh, black blood the respondent had for purposes of the three-fifths clause as well as the, the, sense, the Constitution says, you know, that, that you count Indians, not tax. So you had to find, you know, the number of uh, Indians as well. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, there are times when Jews were a category on the census. There have been times when uh, all kinds of uh, other uh, groups have, have been on the census. I think, though, and tell me if I'm wrong on this, is this the first time in two censuses that there hasn't been any changes to the race question? Um, this is great because the 2010 census will be the same as the 2000 census form. Uh, and so that's it. so. So what is this? Uh, I think you may be suggesting well, be, a, be, kind of calcification, you know, of the yeah, category. I'll, I'll, I'll be very quick in answering this question, but um, because you're both right and wrong, obviously you can look at yeah. the question across history and all kinds of things came and went. But the fundamental structure of it did not. The fundamental structure went from three, uh, white, black, red, to four, white, black, red, yellow. Now there was a period while it was not clear. The Chinese are clearly some alien race, but maybe the Japanese aren't because they're Christian and maybe we're not going to sort of put them into this category. And that went on for two, you know, two or three decades, that argument. But by the end of the 19th century, we had decided all of those kinds of people were Asian. They were in a race group. Um, then we went through a period where, my gosh, uh, what, about these, what about these wrong kind of whites? These Italian whites who, after all, are Catholic, or these uh, uh, Polish whites who, after all, Jewish. Um, and so there was some playing around with this new ethnicity in a more refined way, but at, by, when the dust settled, they were all white. And when the dust settled, everybody's a black. Everybody's one of these five primary groups. Just that's where the dust settled. Yeah, we started with three, we went to four, and then we added the fifth when we added the uh, Pacific Islander. And then the other incredibly interesting thing is we tagged along an ethnicity called the Hispanic. Uh, and so 
Uh, now, whatever you want to call these groups, but we clearly have six major groupings in the society. Well, in terms of size, not, not six. Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that between 2000 and uh, the current census, there was one little difference, and that was uh, they didn't include the uh, examples and the Hispanic, the some other Hispanic, and that created all sorts of havoc. But uh, these are little technical things. But the other thing I wanted to say in terms of research purposes, for example, one of the things that I find fascinating, is, as, as Ken mentioned, that some other um, category in the Hispanic, I mean, in the race question, uh, is seen, uh, when you talk to the census people, it's like a nuisance. It's like this pain of, what do we do with this stupid thing? Let's get rid of it. Uh, last time that happened, I remember Congressman Serrano no, I uh, stuck in a, you know, a little amendment I into a... You, I think you have your mic well, I, 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 I did put in a call, but, uh, but, uh, and, and, and uh, there was a resistance to, to, to changing it. But the other thing that the reason was that uh, in the Latino community, there's a certain, uh, there's a whole research program around the fact that we reject American racial categories. And that's an affirmation that we reject it, uh, we'll put in things like uh, some other race, they'll put in Puerto Rican is a race, uh, those types of things. And it's a source of kind of pride, right, that we're distinct from these other American people that just fall into these stupid these uh, categories. That's part of it. And also there's been a whole research program around uh, cult Latino studies, cultural studies, around this issue of race. There's a, a lot of uh, uh, research on racial identity of Latinos and how it's different and all that stuff. So what happens is uh, when you talk to the census people, they go, ah, this thing's a nuisance, it's not useful. Uh, in the Latino community, that's taken as also uh, kind of attacking a whole area of research within the Latino community that is valued by a whole bunch of people. So uh, even when you talk about co uh, common you know, agendas and common uses, there are differences uh, in terms of the different communities and how they use the information, how they perceive the, the, uh, the, the, the data and the questions. Okay, yeah. Mike, uh, Mike, uh, Mike well, Can I just yeah, one sure. quick comment yeah. on that? Uh, because, uh, uh, w you know, I, I, um, I agree with and acknowledge um, uh, the dynamic that Angelo just identified. But I also want to underscore another dynamic that I think we all recognize, which is that uh, within the Hispanic community, Latino community, uh, you know, race cuts across it. Uh, you know, it, it, uh, it may make a difference to be a, um, a black person from a dark-skinned person from Puerto Rico as opposed to a white person from Puerto Rico or uh, from the Dominican Republic or whatever. And in fact, it's not only Latino communities or Hispanic communities, but if you look um, across the world, uh, either within or outside of the United States, skin color, dark skin, um, is uh, a, um, uh, a, a cause for great discrimination. Uh, and so part of the concern within the African-American community was the continued ability to measure uh, and identify that discrimination, to quantify it uh, when it goes on. All right, my, my gambit worked. Yeah, I'm um, sorry, uh, you were, uh, we, we ought to get really yeah. in, but just before, okay. I just wanted a quick thing, just to underline what, what Ted just said. It is really important to know that there is a good research literature on the fact that darkness itself, skin color, matters enormously. That is within so-called race groups. The dark hued part of that race group, whether it's the Asians, whether it's the Native American Indians, whether it's the African Americans, do not do as well as the lighter skinned, uh, quote unquote, members of that race group. Uh, and there is, there is something really deep in the discriminatory uh, practice of, of, of world history, which is, is tied to darkness itself. And you know, there's a lot of metaphors uh, for this. So, there are people who say, and, and, and not dumb at all, that throw all of this categorization out and simply measure uh, the darkness of the skin, and we will have a better measure of discrimination than these kind of gross categories called Asia and African American and so forth. Although that is complicated because you know, some research we had done, we, had, uh, we were able to do a household survey years back, the Latino National Political Survey, and we were able to get the, uh, the interviewers to kind of rate the person's skin color. And we asked the census questions. And uh, I did a, I remember I did a paper on this and looking at the correlation between skin color and racial self-identification and found there actually very low co uh, correlation between the two. 
Uh, and so, and then I look at the work of the, uh, Doug Massey and these guys looking at uh, the effect of skin color in, in Puerto Rican communities in terms of segregation. And then I'm saying, wait a minute, is this a, if, if he's using the census thing and there's a, co a low correlation between skin color and how people perceive themselves, there's a disconnect there. And it's hard to explore because within the census you can't, you can't look you can't look at it. So and there's also the issue about which we didn't talk about how as you have multiple racial categories or even multiple national origin categories, the issue of uh, which one uh, takes priority, which is your primary one and which is secondary, which is also lost in all these questions. You know because uh, you know uh, that's that and you know I think the national uh, health statistics people have a, a question that actually asks which is your primary identity. So that's also kind of missing as well. Okay, we've got on the table, before I get to a question, we've got on the table now six or seven different reasons to be asking this question. There's numbers. You want to identify the size of communities for reasons of political power and voting power or the flow of money and other kinds of resources to communities. We've got um, uh, a particular history, the lingering effects of past um, past discrimination and past disparities that need to be identified, addressed, remedied through these data. You've got the question of new, new what Ken calls new Americans, a cultural acculturation, assimilation, um, and the flow of communities um, um, inside the country. You've got the question of, of racial and ethnic identifying and remedying disparities of, of a variety of kinds among a lot of different communities, whether they're sort of historically discriminated against communities or not. You've got the issue of just simply enforcing the law. There are laws um, and court judgments that require the use of these data, uh, or data like these, um, in order to in order to to implement uh, laws. You've got um, uh, this sort of affirmation of the community. Community, there's communities that want to be able to point to their numbers in the census data and say, yes, here we are. We're this size. We're bigger than we used to be. We're bigger than those other guys. Um, and there's research. Um, there are communities of, of scholars, of social scientists, of policy analysts, of, of, um, of people in policy schools all over the world, or all, all over the country at least, who are you know, just salivating, waiting for the next round of census mm -hmm. data to come out so that they can manipulate them and, and, and find all kinds of interesting things. I mean, manipulate in the best possible sense, right? <laughs> so there are lots of research, there are lots of purposes on the table. It's not clear that they're compatible with each other. The next question I think that that leads up to is, to, is um, is something that, that each of you, I think, has alluded to. I'm going to take Rudy's question first while you ponder this. Um, and that is, several of you talked about this as a political non-starter. This sort of Ken's proposal to re, really radically, I think, reformulate the question. Um, I think it should be a beginning to come into view why this is a political non-starter, but I want to talk about that in a minute. But I want to let Professor De La Garza uh, ask a question. I have two points. I think first, and, and here I would strongly disagree with Angela, my sense of how the, why the Latino community has taken on the label, as you said, is out of a real envy over the alleged benefits that blacks had of the status. Now, I've never understood what Latino thought it was better off to be like blacks, given the status of black. But so the whole effort to create an identity, in my judgment, and there's a lot of work that you know, I've done some of it, where that was part of that motivation, which is a little different, was strongly different, I think, than what you said. It. The second point, and this, this, I want to defend part of what Ken said and challenge the litigators. I've been an expert witness on voting rights acts in Texas, in Florida, in, in New England, several places, uh, for blacks and for Latinos. And one of the things that I find increasingly problematic is that, first of all, the category of Latino in the DRA is 75 isn't a racial category, it's a language category. Now that's really bizarre because what you end up producing is a huge type two error. You bring in everybody who has allegedly Spanish language in their background and call them a minority because of their alleged inability to speak English and to participate fully in English. 
Now that was very true when it came out of the Texas influence. It's really very untrue for the native born Latino. Today then, <coughs> the major lawsuits that I'm familiar with about Latino voting discrimination and um, misrepresentation is based on continued immigrant inflow. They're driving the demand for redistricting. Now there's a logical problem here. How is it, and again, I, I'm on the side of the guys who I want to criticize. How is it that a Mexican immigrant yesterday has the right to sue for not being represented today in the United States? Logically, that doesn't make sense. They couldn't have been discriminated here because they weren't here. But they get here, so now they can claim, under the language provision, discrimination. And they do it. And this is what I think what Ken has proposed is the essential to fixing this somehow. We need data in the census, which we don't have, in this other category of immigrant generation, so you can track movement. Otherwise, as you know, you put people like me, I can claim eight generations out of Arizona with the guy from Mexico who got here yesterday. And in the census, essentially, we're one of the same. That's nonsensical. And only some kind of change, as you described, is it, can get you out of that box and knock the hell out of all the litigators and voting rights, but maybe Maybe, and here I, I don't want to take Zakharov's point too far, because I think he went too far on that, but maybe we've gone too far using the old remedy for a problem that really is not the same as it once was. I really would like to hear from the litigators on that. What well, do you mean you disagree with me, but you want to, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, there's a lot in there. Uh, so, let, let, let's be clear, uh, so, so I covered this in about three weeks in my course, but here's the 30-second version. In order to uh, establish um, in the redistricting context, uh, context a claim of discriminatory impact, you have to show that the racial group is um, a politically cohesive group, that whites uh, vote that, that there's racially polarized voting, that the, that the racial minority group votes for certain candidates and the, and the uh, majority, let's say whites, vote for a different candidate, and that the racial community is large enough so that you could draw, say, a district in which they would be able to elect their candidate of choice or have an equal opportunity to do so, okay? So for purposes of the law, actually, if a Latino community is not politically cohesive, so that, that say, old, I, I grew up in Miami, so, I mean, talk about, you know, different uh, types of uh, Latino community, right? So Cuban-Americans are going to be very different than, um, than you know, Mexican-Americans. And more than that, older Cubans are going to be very different than, than newly uh, to younger Cubans who've been here, uh, you know, a third generation. Uh, but if they're not politically cohesive, okay, don't worry about it. Because, I mean, that, that, that if, it, if, if what you're saying is true, that there really is no identifying political um, cohesion to the group. I never, I never used the word political cohesion. No, I, that's what I am. I'm saying, so, 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 but if it is true that there are going to be different, you know, there will be differences based on when people immigrated, et cetera, um, and you are right that the, the fact that they are a language minority status under the Voting Rights Act, which is actually, I mean, I wouldn't put too much on the fact that it's called a language minority as opposed to a way to add to, um, you know, in the later amendments to the Voting Rights Act to add other groups that are protected. Yes, it's true that they define it by language, but, um, uh, you know, call, call an ethnic group or racial group, whatever you want. It's just another way to say, all right, these people have a claim under the Voting Rights Act. Um, and, you know, that, that uh, th there are good, look, there are plenty of people who disagree with this type of litigation for all kinds of reasons, right? And Supreme Court, look, John Roberts thinks this is unconstitutional. I mean, he said so when he was a lawyer at the Justice Department, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. This, so, you know, you, you 
there are plenty of people who take that view. Um, but if you think that redistricting can discriminate against a population, and uh, we think that is a, a problem that, that you need to solve, well then, um, you know, th this test that we have, this standard, is one way of, of dealing with it. Now, there are plenty, as I said, plenty of reasons why we don't, we might say, ah, it shouldn't be relevant in the redistricting process, you shouldn't pay attention to the creation of majority-minority districts, there are people who think this leads to the balkanization of America, whatever. I mean, if you believe that, then, then the Voting Rights Act is the problem, it's not the racial categories, right? But if we think that it is a problem, then you need some kind of data to describe the community and then make uh, inferences about how they should be represented. Let me say, say quickly that, as quickly as I can anyway, that um, uh, you, you uh, make an interesting observation about the nature of the Voting Rights Act. Uh, that is to say that when it comes to Latinos, uh, uh, it, uh, it sounds like what we're talking about is a language minority group, but the litigation proceeds uh, pretty much um, uh, on the assumption that what we're talking about is a racial minority group and the two get conflated. Uh, although for other purposes, uh, they're not conflated. Uh, depends on what the, what's going on. But the, uh, uh, the issue that you raise with respect to immigrants, uh, of course, in, uh, and you must know this as an expert uh, witness in these cases, but uh, for purposes of determining whether or not um, there is a large, um, co large enough and coherent um, a Latino community, for example, uh, you count the voting age um, population, but it's not just voting age population, not VAP, just VAP, it's CVAP, the citizen voting age population. That's what gets counted. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that immigration doesn't have an impact on uh, these cases. I remember years ago I lived in Los Angeles for a few years and there was a case that was litigated involving the uh, LA County Board of Supervisors, a case called Garza, in which um, I was uh, lead counsel for African-Americans who intervened in the case to protect the interests of the black community. The case originally was brought by um, uh, Latinos. There's no question that the case was filed when the uh, Mexican-American community in L.A. County, uh, because of immigration, had reached a certain stage, a certain point in time, where the citizen uh, voting age population was large enough, but there's a lag between immigration and uh, that, that point. Uh, but it is, uh, it is impacted by immigration, no question about it, but it's only when you get uh, to the point where you have enough CBAT uh, that you can actually use Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act uh, in these cases. Uh, the point you make, though, the, the first point, though, is I think a very interesting point. Um, uh, I'm not sure what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just ask Angelo a uh, version of Rudy's question, which is, is, I mean, isn't Rudy right that you, you benefit from this ca classification policy that conceptually, illogically, in some sense, from one point of view, lumps together recent immigrants with people who trace their ancestry back eight generations and find, then find themselves in Mexico. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, um, on, on the first question, for example, in terms of why Latinos might compare themselves to blacks, uh, one of the things that's been interesting is when you start to des disaggregate that minority, racial ethnic minority category, there's a hierarchy. There's a, clearly a hierarchy where you have, for example, uh, Latinos in fact seeing in many places blacks as gatekeepers. It's all relative. Uh, and then within the Latino community here in New York, for example, Dominicans see Puerto Ricans as gatekeepers. And it goes on and on and on so that, yeah, there is that kind of, uh, kind of competition comparing uh, the experiences. And, but it's all re relative, right, because we've all been taught to, 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 thought to say uh, uh, racial ethnic minorities, they're all poor, they're all, uh, they're all in the same boat. So it gets kind of interesting when in a city like New York, uh, two-thirds of the population is now communities of color. We have to think about them in a different way. It's no longer white versus non-white, or you know, majority versus minority, and it gets complicated. So that there are various reasons why uh, there is that. But I think the, the issue is how you conceptualize kind of discriminatory regimes, and in, in, in the sense of 
Uh, do you see it as a situation where there are certain indicators uh, based on a, a pattern of discrimination that indicate that there will likely be discrimination against a person because of their language, because of their skin color, uh, because of their foreignness or whatever? Uh, and do you have to wait to, as a group, to develop a series of uh, discriminatory experiences before you're legit and you can bring a case? Or can you, in fact, say, look, it's likely that these people are, will be discriminated against, uh, can be discriminated against tomorrow. So it's a question of conceptually how you, how you look at this stuff. Because there's a case, for example, and there's some people in the black community, for example, that say Latinos don't have any legitimate uh, cases in terms of, to bring in terms of discrimination. This is really, uh, when you talk about the civil rights movement and you talk about uh, trying to, this is basically something that comes out of the African-American experience in the US. What the hell are they adding the Latinos to this thing and adding Asians and all these groups? Uh, so, so it's really a question of how you see this. Is it a kind of a, a narrow view of, of groups that have experienced discrimination? Because in the black community, right, uh, you have the same problem like with Haitians and West Indians. What the hell are they doing claiming affirmative action and getting into all these programs, whereas African Americans who experienced, you know, hundreds of years of discrimination ain't getting shit, you know. So, so you wind up with, with those kinds of uh, discussions. Is, is the, should you go that narrow? Is there, or uh, do you take a broader kind of view of trying to eliminate discrimination and even anticipating situations where groups, because of certain characteristics, will pro more likely be, be discriminated against? So it's, it's, it's uh, we've been just debating this for 30 years, so I don't, I don't think I can resolve. All right, well, I don't think we're gonna settle a 30-year debate. Um, Right now, yeah. so but Ken, quick to wrap up, up for the purpose of the course, two things. Um, just remember what we said a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we said in the 19th century races were biology. We said in the 20th century the races were socially constructed, and we're saying in the 21st century they're also affirmation and identity constructed. They're always statistically constructed. There is no conversation, a public. There's no public policy conversation that is not about the statistical races, because you gotta go count something. And it's this classification system that gives us those counts. I wanna thank our guests for a really stimulating <laughs>